Okay. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us today. I want to especially thank uh, Professor Robert Marks uh, for joining us. Um, thanks to the CSUSB History Department, History Club, College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and the Intellectual Life Fund. Uh, and also great thanks to Pam Crossan in the History Department for making these events possible with her organizational and supporting work. Professor Robert Marks is, uh, Dr. Robert Marks is Professor Emeritus of History at Whittier College, um, which, is, which is geographically close to us here in, in San Bernardino. Um, and uh, he received his BA, his MA, and his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, his work focuses on the history of the environment in East Asia, Chinese history, world history, um, and environmental history. I'm just adjusting some settings here on the Zoom to make sure everything is going to run smoothly. I want to remind everybody to, um, to feel free to send questions to Professor Marks and, um, and myself in the chat. And after Professor Marks's initial remarks, uh, his initial comments, you'll be able to uh, uh, discuss uh, your questions and talk a bit more um, about anything that you'd like to discuss. After 41 years on the Whittier faculty, Professor Marks retired in 2019. He's the author of several notable books and articles on Chinese and world environmental history, including Tigers, Rice, Silk, and Silt, Environment and Economy in South China from Cambridge University Press, The Origins of the Modern World, A Global and Environmental Narrative from the 15th to the 21st Century from Roman and Littlefield. Um, also, China and Environmental History, which is in its second edition. Um, an earlier rural revolution in South China, Peasants and the Making of History in Haifeng County, 1570 to 1930 from the University of Wisconsin Press. Professor Marks has presented papers at conferences in China, Hong Kong, Sweden, Norway, Japan, and the Netherlands. And in 1997, he received the Aldo Leopold Award for the best article in the journal Environmental History from the American Society for Environmental History. And Tigers was featured in the New York Historical Society's Books That Matter campaign in 2008. He has received numerous fellowships, including the Graves Award, awarded by the American Council of Learned Societies, several National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowships, fellowships for research in China, and in 2017, he was elected to the Board of Directors of the Association for East Asian Environmental History. In March of 2020, he was honored by colleagues from around the world for his role over the past 25 years in founding and growing the field of Chinese environmental history. In 2002, Marx was named the Richard and Billy Deal Professor of History, a year after he received the Harry Nurhood Teaching Excellence Award. And like many professors at Whittier College, Marx helped engage students in research for his various books and articles, including Origins of the Modern World. Students were given the opportunity to critique Marx's work and suggest addition, additional materials. Marx served on the uh, AP World History Development Committee and as director for the California World History Association. Um, I, I want to uh, particularly thank uh, Professor Marks for joining us um, in these unusual circumstances. Um, it's really a delight uh, for us to learn about this topic um, and, and such, a, such a timely topic indeed it is. Um, so I'll be posting a couple additional links for anybody who's interested to Professor Marks's books in the chat, you can find them and click through there, including, um, including his, his, uh, his recent works, uh, some of which we'll be discussing today. Um, so you can click through, order those books, it will take you straight to the publisher's websites. Um, and I, I hope you do that. Uh, and in the meantime, please feel free at any point to type a question or a comment uh, into the chat. And at the end of Professor Marx's initial comments, uh, we'll be able to discuss that. Um, please join me in, in giving Professor Marks a virtual uh, warm welcome, and uh, thank you very much, Bob. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, you're welcome, uh, Jeremy. Professor Murray, um, thanks for the invitation to do this. Um, it's, it, it is uh, odd to be doing these things uh, virtually by Zoom, um, but in some ways it's easier for people around the world to, uh, to get together, even if it is virtually. Um, and I'm about 350 miles away myself at the moment. So uh, it would have been a little bit more difficult for me to get there. Um, anyway, today I'm going to talk about uh, 
combination of uh, current uh, conditions. Um, uh, very briefly, what I'm going to do is just introduce um, some of the uh, economic development over the last 40 years, uh, very briefly, um, and then go to uh, uh, set up some of the environmental challenges that China currently faces. Um, and I want to do a, a brief case study of that, um, uh, highlighting what uh, I think all of us uh, understand to be the, uh, the conflict or the contradiction between uh, the desire to pursue economic growth and economic development um, with uh, environmental issues and environmental protection. Um, they're not always uh, in, in concert. Um, and I'm going to look at the uh, uh, case study of uh, in Yunnan province of uh, the attempts to build uh, hydroelectric power on uh, the Nujiang, the Angry River there. Um, and then I want to put that into a broad historical context of merely the last 3,000 years of uh, China's um, environmental history. And um, I'm going to keep track of time, and we're going to do that in 40, 45 minutes or so. So some of the slides uh, I'll go through uh, quicker than, than others. Um, and uh, mostly what I'm doing is I'll be sharing uh, material that comes from um, my book, uh, China and Environmental History. Um, and I just wanted to point out the, uh, the photograph that's on this uh, cover. Uh, this is a, a hillside, a mountainside in, in Fujian province where um, the, the trees, the natural vegetation, and uh, trees are solar converters. They convert solar energy into uh, useful things for, uh, for humans and others. Um, but uh, in one of the ironies of, of development, those trees, those solar collectors have been replaced with, well, actual solar collectors that take the energy that had been going into plants um, and the environment and direct it uh, to, uh, to human use. Uh, more or less directly. Um, and that's, that's one of the outcomes of uh, 3,000 years of economic development and uh, environmental change in China as well. Um, so let me get started here. Um, and I think many of us know this, that uh, China today is the uh, second largest industrial economy, um, second only to the United States. Um, and over the uh, last 40 years, it has followed uh, socialist and capitalist approaches to economic development. And uh, China is fast catching up with the US and is largely expected as a size of its economy to uh, surpass that of the United States shortly, uh, although not on a per capita basis. Um, also until about uh, eight, 1980 or so when the rapid industrialization began, um, China was uh, mostly rural um, and I'll, touch on that a little bit uh, later. Um, and the industrialization that was followed in the, uh, even before 1980 under Maoist and then uh, Deng Xiaoping and then later approaches, um, there was little concern for uh, the environmental consequences of industrialization. And as uh, Xi Jinping said, he was the first uh, director of China's Environmental Protection Agency, said the approach was industrialize first and clean up later. Um, and that's uh, problematic in many ways because uh, uh, all economic development, whether it's industrialization or rural agricultural development, uh, transforms nature. And so the more, in, the more econ an economy becomes uh, capturing natural processes for, uh, for human use, it transforms nature as well. Um, and so it's not too surprising that China's rapid industrialization led to over the last uh, 30 years, a significant amount of, of environmental problems. The uh, pollution of, of air, water, and soil um, was uh, particularly important and it was uh, uh, reaching quite uh, dire levels in early or oh, the last 20 years or so. Um, the uh, dumping of waste from industrial enterprises into, uh, into waterways um, led to the, the, the fact of something on the order of over 600 villages and villagers who were getting uh, their water from these uh, polluted waterways uh, became known as ca cancer villages. And for quite some time, the uh, Chinese government hid those, but uh, some years ago, all of the location of these um, cancer villages 
uh, became known and we could, uh, we could follow them on, uh, on maps as well. Um, and it didn't take too long. This is the beginning about uh, eight years ago of uh, current reactions against and the attempts to clean up the messes from the industrialization uh, when China declared a war against pollution. And about the same time, presidents, uh, US President Obama at the time and Chinese uh, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping announced an agreement to uh, limit carbon emissions and that agreement between China and the United States led to the feasibility of the Paris Climate Agreement in December 2015. Without the US and China cooperating on that, it probably wouldn't have happened. Uh, and of course, we know um, that Trump withdrew the US from the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, but China did not um, and continued to find ways to deal with the uh, um, environmental consequences of industrialization. And they were the first to actually put together carbon markets and trades to cap the emission of, uh, of uh, carbon into the, into the atmosphere. And that uh, has become a commitment on the part of the Chinese to advance what uh, they call uh, ecological civilization, um, which means that, uh, that civilization and nature human civilization and nature can in fact uh, coexist. Um, uh, interesting question as to whether that's an ideology or whether that's an actual set of programs. Um, and most recently, this is just a couple of weeks ago, um, in addition to uh, uh, declaring war on, on, uh, on pollution and creating an ecological civilization, uh, Xi Jinping claim that uh, economic development has in fact ended rural poverty um, in China. Uh, it's, it's, there's a definition of what rural poverty means um, in China, uh, but it's, uh, it's linked with the rapid movement of people from rural areas. You know, this, here we go back around 1980, it was still 80% rural into urban areas. Um, this is uh, one place in the, uh, um, uh, the uh, Yangtze drainage system where people had to climb up and down stairs to get to their villages. People on these village tops have been moved into, um, into cities over the past, especially the la last 10 years rather quickly. So there's um, very briefly some sense, let me back up there, of China's current um, environmental issues and the relationship between rapid economic development, especially industrialization, and um, environmental issues and environmental problems. And uh, it's often easy to think that all we're all of China's current economic or, and or at rather um, environmental problems arise from just the last uh, 40 years or since 1949 in the establishment of the People's Republic of China. But China does have a very long 3,000 year plus uh, history that's documented that allows us to see um, some of the current issues, China's economic development and current environmental issues in a very long term uh, historical perspective. And so I've got um, a map up here and we, I'll be using this uh, a number of times, but the, uh, the point, many points here, China, uh, its current borders um, is about the same size as the United States and has uh, uh, this, actually the exact same number of uh, terrestrial ecosystems to, uh, within, its, uh, within its borders, 599. Um, it has uh, over 30,000 seed plants. Unfortunately, 40 to 80% of those are now threatened and uh, 6,300 vertebrates. Um, and uh, 20 to 40 percent of mammal species uh, are now in, endangered. So what I want to do is um, take a look at this conflict between uh, the needs for economic development currently and then uh, some of the environmental issues um, in the uh, Three Parallels Rivers region uh, of Yunnan. 
Um, it's down here in the far southwest, and I'll show, a blow, show you a blow up of that um, in a moment. But it's an area of uh, one of the most exceptional areas of biodiversity, not simply in China, but within the world. Um, and I'll get to that as to why, why that is. And the, uh, the controversy focuses around the, uh, the Nujiang, um, which is the last undammed river in China. Um, there are about 84,000 dams in China on all, all the rivers except this one. Uh, interestingly, there's about 80,000 dams on most on all of the rivers in the United States as well. Um, so the, uh, the issue became one of, of trying to tap the extraordinary water power coming out of the, uh, uh, the rivers that come down into China flowing from the Himalayas downward um, and sometimes dropping up to six to 8,000 feet with a heck of a lot of uh, potential for hydroelectric um, development. Um, this is a blow up of the three parallel rivers region um, that I just showed you. And what we've got is the headwaters of the, of the Yangtze here, the uh, Jinsha River. And here is the Lansang or also known as the uh, Mekong River that goes down through Vietnam. Um, and here is the Nujiang, the, also known as the Salween, which goes through Burma. And then there's one other uh, major river that comes out of the Himalayas, but it goes and turns and hits into, into uh, India. This is the, uh, uh, this is the Brahmaputra uh, River going this way. And what happened here is that the, over the last 50 million years, the South Asian tectonic plate rammed into the Asian tectonic plate and it just simply crushed the uh, uh, two plates together, made the Himalayas rise up and put these rivers into um, a very close proximity here. And this is the three parallel rivers region. I guess these uh, shots give you some idea of, of what it looks like um, in some of the distances. Um, the, uh, it's one of the most uh, biodiverse areas in, in the world. And that comes from both the, oops, the, uh, the distances between the highest peaks between 15,000 and 18,000 feet and the rivers that run anywhere from uh, 10 to down to uh, 5,000 feet through these, uh, through these gorges. So a huge number of uh, ecosystems for uh, living things to, uh, to exploit. Um, and these are some of the, uh, the species that are endemic to um, the, uh, the three parallel rivers region. Um, nearly all rhododendrons um, found their origins in, uh, in this region. There's the uh, uh, great green peacocks, the red panda, which actually isn't a panda, and this shows its um, its habitat area. And then there's the uh, Yunnan snub-nosed monkey. Um, and that, ex that its area of habitat is only in the upper reaches of the, um, of the Nujiang, especially the Nujiang. Um, and the, uh, the UN UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, Program called this region, the Three Parallel Rivers region, one of the world's most important remaining areas for the conservation of Earth's biodiversity. Um, so it's not just uh, China's biodiversity, but I'll show you a slide that gives you some idea, but Earth's biodiversity. Um, and um, that is precisely the area where the Chinese government starting uh, in the early 2000s um, made a proposal to dam the, uh, the Nujiang with uh, a cascade of 14, 14 dams. Now the idea um, was to take the hydroelectric power that could be tapped in Yunnan province and export it to the East Coast areas that were rapidly developing and needing um, electricity. And uh, it's pretty interesting, but the, uh, the discourse um, on all of these planners, it was a, a war discourse. Uh, to, to develop hydroelectric power um, to be waged like a war. There was a beach assault on Yunnan 
troops were advanced into Yunnan to build dams and Yunnan was considered to be an electricity mothership. And of course, uh, the development of hydroelectric power can be um, spun as being, as not emitting any um, carbon into the atmosphere and is, uh, is therefore green. There's obviously a debate about that, uh, but that was the idea. So here's the, uh, the map of the proposed 14 uh, dam cascade for um, putting in hydroelectric plants. Um, a cascade, it's called a cascade because it starts up here around 10,000 feet, goes down and down and down and down into the uh, uh, plains in Yunnan province, about 5,000 feet. Um, but mostly the uh, plan initially focused on the, the Nujiang, the angry river here. Uh, the problem was, uh, it's not just simply um, an area of extraordinary biodiversity, uh, but there are also human people, humans who live there. There are 13 different peoples totaling about 300,000 people who live in this, this area. Um, not Han Chinese, but uh, there's seven, at least seven different peoples who live there. Um, here again is the, the Nujiang. And all of these different colored regions are of the different peoples um, living there along the river whose lives and livelihood uh, would be uh, affected by the building of those dams. And this is what would have to happen to those people were those dams built. They would have to be removed. And part of that uh, gets pushed into the story of what happened in the, uh, in the Yangtze um, on the Yangtze River with the building of Three Gorges Dam, millions of people were displaced. There's a Lansong Dam uh, down here um, that also displaced, that was built in the 1980s, displaced a large number of people as well. So the, uh, the plan to develop all these, this hydroelectric power um, transformed this region into a world environmental hotspot. So just to give you an idea of in this small region, 25% um, of all of China's animal species are there. 20% of China's higher plants are there. And depending on how you count, something between uh, an eighth and a quarter of world biodiversity remains here, all of which would have been affected by the development of this cascade of dams. And so not, not unsurprisingly, there was a considerable amount of pushback against the idea of building these 14, this cascade of 14 dams um, there. There's uh, international NGOs, green, Chinese green NGOs, uh, a very, uh, an excellent documentary um, from 2011 called Waking the Green D Dragon, which is in English. And it's a, an interesting one uh, to, uh, to watch to see about this. Um, but all of this resistance led um, in the late 20 teens uh, to the decision to, uh, to hold off on the development of these dams. Um, and so at the moment, there has not been a, the construction of these dams, although there's um, indications that preliminary work is going on. But for the moment, the interests of environmental protection um, have held back the development and damming of uh, the last undammed river in China. Um, a microcosm of the, of the, uh, the, the, uh, the conflict between the, the desire, the needs for industrialization, rapid economic development, the elimination of poverty within China, and then the environmental costs that that would have. So now what I'd like to do is put this into uh, a fairly long-term historical context. And the question is why, oops, that came down. <laughs> why is it that so much, such a large percentage, not just of China's biodiversity, but of the world's biodiversity is in this one small spot on the planet Earth that happens to be uh, within China. Um, and that's what I want to, uh, to get to now. And what that story involves is uh, long-term 
uh, process by which the forests of China were basically removed and made way for um, agriculture, agricultural development. Um, and the use, uh, basically it's a, it's a large long-term colonization project um, going from, well, even before the, uh, uh, the Zhou dynasty 3000 years ago, um, even preceding that, uh, but we'll just do the last 3000 years or so. Um, but from the, uh, from the Zhou uh, to the Han about 2000 years ago, um, this region up here was basically deforested, um, making way for a, a Chinese, Han Chinese population of between 20 and 60 million from about uh, 500 BC to about uh, uh, the middle of the Han 2000 years ago. So by about a th 2000 years ago, this part of China was uh, deforested. By the Song Dynasty, by about a thousand years ago, when the population had grown to uh, about 100 million, um, much of the Yangtze River Valley was deforested and drained and other things to make way for, uh, for rice paddies. In particular, um, some projects were in the, uh, the, the hills here and then into uh, Sichuan as well. Uh, but by about a thousand years ago, this region had been deforested. Southern part of China was still largely evergreen uh, forest, some of it a tropical monsoon forest. And by the uh, last 400 years, last four centuries or so, um, population grew to between 200 and 430 million by about 150 years ago. And these hills and mountains were largely deforested in many places, um, made possible by uh, new world food crops that could be brought into the, uh, into the hillsides and into the hill country of the South. In particular, maize, um, corn, peanuts, potatoes, and a number of other things that could be uh, used to bring these lands under uh, agricultural production as well. So what we have is a very long-term history of agricultural development, the spread of uh, Han Chinese into regions that they hadn't been in, so that by 1950, 7%, only 7% 7 of the forests that had been there 3,000 years ago uh, remained. Now, it wasn't just um, that the forests were taken out, but all of this region and regions where the agricultural development occurred were in parts of China that were inhabited by uh, other peoples with their own histories. And this is a whole nother story. I'm not gonna get into it um, much here. Um, but uh, when the uh, agricultural expanded, it was not just uh, taking down trees where there was nothing other than trees there. Um, there were people whose lives and livelihoods were disrupted and they had choices of how to deal with it, uh, to flee, to fight, uh, to assimilate among others. Um, but by uh, the turn of the 20th century, this area is pretty much open for uh, uh, Chinese style agriculture. Now the forests were uh, not just stands of, uh, of trees, as I said, but the forests were inhabited by other creatures. And I'm gonna take a look at the Asian elephant and the South China tiger or the tiger. Um, but there were other animals as well that we know of that have been driven to extinction or close to extinction. Uh, the Yangtze uh, Baiji dolphin um, is last one was seen about 20 years ago. The uh, giant soft shell turtle, there were two of them 10 years ago in uh, a male and a female in different uh, zoos. Um, and the female, I think it was the female died leaving uh, the last uh, surviving member of that species there. Um, and then the grassland wolf um, up in the, uh, the north in the steppe that has also been um, endangered, not, not extinct yet. And uh, so as I said, I wanna take a look at just briefly um, what happened when the forests were gone and what happened to the Asian elephant and then the, uh, the tiger. The Asian elephant um, is not 
a, not a grassland elephant, it's a different species than the uh, African elephant, which lives in grasslands. The Asian elephant is a, uh, is a forest dweller for the most part. Um, although with uh, agricultural development and the especially growing of rice from the Yangtze River South, um, a, the Asian elephants uh, particularly enjoyed uh, in living in the, uh, in the forest, but um, the, uh, the rice paddies and the growing rice crops were uh, a certain wonderful target for them. And they uh, <clears throat> entered into the historical record um, in terms of uh, people having to deal with um, elephant depredations. But the point is, is that these lines represent the last time that elephants were south of here, then they were ex extirpated here, and then by about the beginning of the, uh, the Sung, the Yangtze River uh, Delta, then by later in the Sung down to, uh, to Zhejiang and, and Fujian. Uh, by 1600, they no longer existed up here, but were only in the western part of Lingnan in Guangxi. And by 1980, the Asian elephant had been pushed to this small part of China um, in Yunnan province. And there were maybe 150 individuals left um, in China by then. And this whole story um, is, has been captured in uh, Mark Elvin's book, The Retreat of the, uh, of the Elephant. But it was also based on uh, work that uh, Chinese um, uh, zoologists, historical zoologists had done. So the removal of, uh, of forest, the encounter with other peoples, and the destruction of habitat that had supported the elephant moved with the expansion of, uh, of agriculture. Uh, much the same thing happened with, uh, with the tiger in China, although we don't have the dates for uh, as much as we can date the, uh, uh, the retreat of the elephant. <clears throat> but we do know that uh, about uh, 2,500 years ago, when Confucius was about uh, 49 years old, uh, this is the range of the, uh, the tiger. Um, India up through um, the uh, eastern parts of Siberia, and then down into Southeast Asia as well. Um, and in fact, uh, the, uh, the tiger, sometimes it's called an Asian tiger, but tigers only existed in this region. You could say that tigers almost defined what it meant to be Asian. Um, but by 2009, this is what happened to the, uh, the tiger. Yikes, what happened? There we go, we're back. Um, <clears throat> so, this is the uh, IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of, of Nature. This is their map. And tigers by 2009, there were some Siberian tigers up here. But the South China tiger has been extirpated from within the boundaries of China. And this map is, is extraordinary for a lot of reasons, but it shows that, uh, that politics and power, political power, um, actually matter as to where um, these, uh, these animals exist and where they don't. Um, today, the tiger still exists in uh, various places in China, but it is not in the wild. There are some uh, preserves and tigers, unfortunately, have been raised for body parts as well, especially in uh, uh, tiger wine. Um, but they no longer um, exist within the borders of China, as I said, with the exception of some Siberian tigers up there. So over this long period of time, um, agriculture is developing, Chinese population is growing, species are um, disappearing. And we know that historically, when we look back and we can reconstruct that, um, but what is rather extraordinary is that in the prefectural gazetteer from 1811, for this part of China, this is Leizhou Peninsula, and that was Leizhou Prefecture. Um, under the uh, editorship of Deng Qinan, who was the prefect of Leizhou at, at, the moment, at the time, I don't know if he wrote it or not, but uh, there is a section in this uh, uh, Leizhou Fujir that shows that he or somebody, whoever wrote this, was very conscious 
of the uh, extinction of species. And they were conscious of the processes by which species went extinct. Um, and the, uh, all this, this comment, this extraordinary comment comes from a, uh, a section of the, uh, of the gazetteer known as, uh, as Tuchan or uh, local products. And I'll read some of this. Um, and those of you who can read Chinese, um, you can read some of what, uh, what was in there. Wu Chan Yin Di Er Sheng Yi Sui Shi Er Yi. And because they come, because these products come from the land, um, and there's been change over time, there is no land, Fei Di Ji Bui, there's no land that hasn't changed. And so what is, uh, what is this? section say. And I just want to read some of this because this is a voice from 200 years ago talking about what had happened to China in the previous 2000 years. And here's, here's my translation. Because local products come from the land and because there are changes in the land, the local products too change over time. Of the common ones mentioned in ancient texts, just 80 to 90% exist today. Of the rare ones, just 20 to 30 percent exist. Today, there is no land that has not changed, so the times are no longer the same either. Then he goes on to mention a number of, of species in, uh, in Lejo that no longer exist. He says, Today, <clears throat> these species are all gone. The reason these extinctions were not recorded before is that people then said that extinction was not possible. Today, it is my task to record for posterity these extinctions in the hope that my records will be of use for later research. Let's see if I've got some of that over here. Um, the reason these extinctions were not recorded before is that people then claimed that extinction was not possible. So uh, there's, it's really interesting on, on lots, of, lots of ways. Um, but the consciousness of extinction is beginning to arise among uh, observers in, uh, in Europe as well, about at the same time. It's a rather uh, interesting, another strange parallel um, in the world that I've been trying to track down a little bit and follow a little bit more. Um, but <clears throat> the fact is, is that, that uh, some folks in China recognize that uh, that extinction was following um, agricultural development. So the, uh, what's interesting here, when you put it at the observation of, of extinction of species in China and compare that with the development of the idea of extinction um, among Europeans, is that Europeans began to attribute extinctions to, uh, to natural causes, um, volcanoes, a few other things. And ultimately, of course, uh, it becomes part of, uh, of uh, Darwin's uh, origin of species. Uh, but the, so Europeans are trying to assign uh, uh, natural causes for extinctions, but to uh, whoever wrote that, uh, that piece in the, uh, the Tuchan section of the Leijo Fujir, um, the reason for the extinction of species was the action of humans. And the evidence that, uh, that uh, they used to uh, put the, get this was the written record that they were able to access in China um, to be able to construct the idea that species had gone um, extinct. Uh, now that to us in these days where we're thinking about the sixth uh, extinction and, and we know that humans have had um, such an immense impact on nature and on the uh, extinction of species around the world, uh, we know that we humans have been doing that and that our actions are beginning to outpace the uh, processes of nature in uh, driving species to extinction. And among other things, I find it extraordinarily interesting uh, and probably significant that 200 years ago in China, there was an observer who was looking at the processes of species extinction and relating it to human economic activity and the actions of humans. Um, Pre-modern, early modern, modern, um, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting uh, set of issues to, uh, to explore. 
Okay, so now, um, <laughs> so what? This is, this is uh, I'm concluding. So I think, uh, Jeremy, we're probably gonna be good to have some time for, uh, for some conversation and questions. Okay, so, so what? Um, one of the so what's here is that to understand China's current situation uh, with environmental uh, uh, issues, you can't just look at what's happened from 1949 and the establishment of the People's Republic um, and real serious industrialization, industrialization, industrialization drives, both under Mao and then later um, the four modernizations and then the rapid industrialization from 1980 to the present. All that has taken place on a base of 3000 years of prior um, environmental change where it had already uh, put a number of species, uh, drawn, driven a number of species to extinction. And that's why in that one small spot in Yunnan province, which has the last undammed river, it's one of the last places in China that has not been economically developed. And that is the reason why um, it is uh, such a special place. It's precious, uh, not just simply in, in terms of Chinese space, but in terms of, uh, of world uh, diversity, um, biodiversity. It's one of the last places which is so extraordinarily diverse, right? And it's not only that this diversity of environments in China supported different plant and animal species, it also supported uh, uh, extraordinary human diversity. And uh, a number of uh, environmental historians of, of China over the last 20 years have been exploring um, the ways in which environment, ethnicity, and biodiversity are intertwined. You can't really do environmental history without understanding the ways in which other peoples uh, interacted with their environment. Um, and <clears throat> in many ways, um, what comes to be called ethnicity when states, central states begin controlling these areas, not just in China, but elsewhere as well. Um, these relations of other peoples to their environments um, is one of the uh, markers of what we now call ethnicity. Um, so what we see is uh, this extraordinarily complex and long-term relationships between humans and their natural environment. Um, and we can document it uh, pretty carefully in China over the last 3000 years. Whereas most other parts of the world, uh, we don't have that long-term of a look as to uh, what the processes of environmental change were. And while we might be able to clean up um, air pollution, we might be able to clean up uh, the pollution of land, and we might be able to uh, clean up the pollution of water, um, species extinction is it. When species go extinct, they're gone. Species extinction, one said, is uh, the death of death. Um, unless, of course, <laughs> we can reconstruct some of these species from uh, um, DNA that's been preserved and can be uh, reconstructed again. And then we get into Jurassic Park scenarios of one form or another. Um, but by and large, um, species, uh, we can't recover species from species extinction. It's the loss of biodiversity. Um, so with that, Jeremy, I think we're under about um, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, 3,000 years of Chinese his environmental history. How's that? Thank you, Robert. That was, a, that, that was definitely a, uh, a crash course, but we also got some really great details and, and a lot to think about and I think a lot to discuss. Um, I noted in the chat that any of our attendees can either raise their hands um, sort of uh, uh, do the, the, the reaction raise hand button um, that looks like that. Um, or, uh, or you can type questions into the chat for our discussion. So I wanna give just a minute for that before I, before I pull rank and uh, try to get my questions in. But, um, but I do have a, 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 a few questions. Um, I don't see any hands popping up right now. Um, but my, my first question, and, and forgive me if it's, a, if it's a bit too contemporary, because I think you're urging us to think long term with this, uh, with this talk, um, but it's about um, the, the specific kind of authoritarianism that's currently 
in play and, and developing. But ah, great. Okay, Mike, my uh, in normal times, my, my carpool partner, Mike Cahote, who's a geographer here at CSUSB has a question. So his will be better than mine and I'll return to it. Um, Mike asks, what is the Chinese philosophical tradition of thinking about the relationship between people and nature? Is it similar to the Western modernism that took people out of nature? Well, there's um, been quite a bit of work on that. Um, and one of, the, uh, uh, one of the points that, that we need to understand is that uh, the, the term nature itself um, is, is, you know, that's Latin, English, you know, European construct, and that there isn't really a, a, an equivalent term for that. Um, the, uh, the best translation probably comes from, uh, from some early Taoist writings, you know, from about 2,500 years ago. Um, to, uh, to see it as the self-so, the zeron, that, that which is self-actualizing. And so there's been uh, uh, a, a conception, there's the Taoist conception, if you, want, if you want to be just very, very brief about it, we can see the three major schools of thought in China, the Taoist, the Confucian, and then Buddhist uh, traditions all have various ways of conceptualizing of the relationship of human beings to what we would call the natural world. Um, and some of those are really pretty interesting. The Taoists, let's be, let's, let's flow with water, let's flow with the way that things are going, let's not try to stop it up. Um, <clears throat> then there are the, uh, the various statist positions um, coming from the, uh, the legalists, the Fajia, um, who are saying, no, 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 you know, just like cramming people into, into, into particular pegs, we got to control nature too. And we got to control nature because then we can extract resources. They didn't put it quite like that, but extracting resources to protect the state became, uh, in, in the warring states period, absolutely essential. Um, and then uh, Confucians had different streams within their thought um, that leaned either more toward the uh, the Taoist let it let it flow kind of philosophy, um, or the uh, the legalist ones of uh, we will control everything, including people and the state and the state interests uh, go, go before uh, all else. Uh, the Buddhists um, also had obviously uh, interesting relationship um, and the Buddhist texts begin to uh, lead to some action during the Tang dynasty um, when uh, the, the, the city of Changsha, capital city of Changsha is being built from, well, from the, uh, even before the Tang. But uh, parks were being built in there, um, and people were reconstructing what they looked, thought nature ought to look like in their uh, in their estates, uh, with uh, with animals. Uh, various rulers had had vast parks. Uh, we call them zoos, uh, where animals were brought in and uh, 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 tended, if you will, over long periods of time, going back to the first emperor and even before that uh, as well. Um, so there's a long, long history of engaging with uh, something that we would call the relationship of humans to uh, to nature, and there's a lot of, lot of, a lot of publication on that, a lot of work on it. Thanks, Bob. That's um, that's that's such a, a rich idea. I remember um, Professor Wakeman, Fred Wakeman, gave a series of talks at UCSD. Um, I think it was just a, a year or a year or so before he passed away. And I think oh oh six oh seven, um, and he talked about this diver this this relationship of sort of rupture and continuity. And when we think about these really long periods of time and these almost continental size regions, the the questions between rupture and continuity over long periods of time and diversity across space come in. Mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you grapple with that? Because I I look at a really small part of China, Hainan Island in a small per time period, um, and they have to make it relevant. But from coming from the other side, how do you sort of encompass all and keep it specific? And I see some of your studies you, you drill down as you did today. Um, but is there a way to, to, to sort of square that circle when we're talking about China across such a long period of time? Um, uh, yeah, I, I've always been interested in the uh, the long term, the long duree. Yeah, you know? so I've always been been trying to look for that uh, because if we focus so much on the present or the, the current, um, we become blinded to to long term 
effects uh, and where we've come from over the very, very long term. And, uh, you know, when I was doing graduate work, uh, Braudel became very important to me and I, I was reading him and, and trying to think of what that would mean for trying to understand China. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in making the argument that these long-term processes that do have some discontinuities within them, but these long-term processes are really understandable. And for China, we're looking at, at 3000 years of uh, colonizing processes um, that, that lead to the transformation of the environment for agricultural production to sustain populations that can provide taxes and foot soldiers to maintain the power of the state. And even if you look at the power of the state, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the history of the People's Republic um, is, a, is a story of the construction and the strengthening of the state. And so even in very, very long term, uh, terms, we can see the, uh, uh, the, the uh, communist state as being part of a long-term continuum. Um, so I'm interested in those continuities and trying to see what appear to be discontinuities or ruptures as more as what uh, Braudel would call ripples on the backs of these long-term streams of continuity that flow through, in this case, China's history and we could probably make it uh, a world history as well. But certainly industrialization in China and globally is a major rupture because what we know is that it ushers in, um, and I agree with this, it ushers in what we now think of as the Anthropocene. Um, and this is, a, this is a time in the history of the planet where humans and our actions are having a greater effect on natural processes than natural processes, right? So there's, there's major ruptures, but we can only understand those in terms of the much longer term, I think. Thanks, Bob. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I had a, a, a few more questions. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Perry, did you want to unmute? Did you want to weigh in? Let me see if I can. Do that. Need some more practice still on this. <laughs> you would have a lot of practice by now. The rest of us are catching up. You'd think that. Yeah. I think I think I've just asked Perry to unmute, but I could be wrong. By the way, I'm looking up now because it's snowing here. Yeah. Oh wow, nice. Yeah. You're in. Uh, do, what What's the area you're in? I think some of our attendees will know where that is. I'm in Northern Mono County, which is I'm about uh, 20 miles north of Mammoth Lakes. Uh, okay. In snow country. All right. Well, I think I, I unmuted Perry, but, I, but then it looks like we might've lost him. So um, maybe he'll, he'll be able to jump back in. But I, I had a question about, um, and again, this is sort of maybe very contemporary. But the idea of the relationship between authoritarianism and sort of um, the, the, the nimble, the potentially nimble policymaking aspect of a very streamlined political process that I think is starting to become touted as a kind of Beijing consensus. And, and most obviously over the past year in terms of the COVID-19 response. Um, so there's this, there was this great propaganda coup for Beijing that was, you know, Donald Trump uh, and, and it's sort of critique of, you know, you want democracy, this is what you're gonna get. Uh, it's gonna be, you're, you're, you're gonna have this kind of a, a leader, um, this kind of erratic leader. But then, uh, then, then COVID-19 kind of gave another huge potential uh, cudgel for the Beijing consensus in the world to say, look, we had this extremely streamlined process um, and everybody was on board uh, within within a matter of week. Well, not everybody was on board, but but I think that's that, that that's sort of very successful political messaging, and especially cities. But that doesn't mean necessarily it's going to happen. He can say, well, actually, it was Zhu uh, Rongji uh, who said we're going to put in a, a cascade of fourteen dams on the uh, Nujiang, and it didn't happen. Right, so it's it's not like uh, these things can just happen from edict up from above. 
um, the, uh, the, 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 the reaction against the dams in the Nujiang uh, was a massive mobilization of people within China and around the world. Um, local, local people did not want to have their lives destroyed. Um, and then uh, as a result of work that some extraordinary people did, uh, we knew and we learned that the, uh, the snub-nosed monkey was, was only found in the world in that one space. And that, that monkey, the snub-nosed monkey became the uh, uh, poster child for what would happen. Uh, it was obviously one of the most anthropomorphic animals on the face of the earth. Uh, but that was uh, an extraordinary moment that uh, galvanized a lot of people um, to, uh, to push back. And they're still pushing back. Um, but that fight for that preserving that, that biodiversity is in that one very small spot in, in China. Um, and so it's a, um, an interesting, interesting struggle that's going on. Um, Clearly, though the uh, the model of of having a, a single party state um, can move a lot faster than uh, than well, with the exception of Joseph Biden, who got things done in what forty seven days. Um, so I think it's complicated. Yeah, you can listen to what uh, what people say about what they can do and what they can accomplish, and say that this is a model that's uh, that's superior to democratic societies. But there's all kinds of uh, ways of understanding the pushback of, of ordinary people onto states that want to dictate what's going to happen. Thanks, Bob. We got a, just a couple more minutes and I had uh, from um, Mike a follow up. Uh, he said, if you can continue um, to pursue the philosophical vein, is communist China's nature society ideology similar to Western modernisms? And does that mean there are no local historical alternative narratives present? That is, yeah, that, 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 uh, that's, that's an excellent question. Can you, can you tr try that again? I was dis distracted by the snow for a second. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, well, the, the, uh, Mike Cahot, who's, who's a, a geographer, also continued his, his earlier, um, in, in the earlier vein of philosophy and about specifically about the communist China's nature society ideology. And I'll recommend to Mike, I love uh, Judith Shapiro's book, Mao's war against nature. I wonder if, uh, if, if you had some thoughts on that, um, Bob. That, but is communist China's nature society ideology similar to Western modernisms? Um, and does that mean there are no local historical alternative narratives? How much is that sort of ruled yeah, out? You know, I, I think it's clear that, uh, that, uh, that you know, we can go to, back to uh, Marxist and then uh, modernist thought which was to, the purpose of humans was to uh, uh, control and, and uh, master nature. Um, that, that, that's the modernist project, you know, it, it, in a nutshell. And it's not just, uh, it's modern science um, and it's, uh, it's Marxist as well. And I think the, uh, you know, the communist state um, has that attitude for the most part, um, ecological civilization notwithstanding. Um, and are there other possible alternatives? Uh, you know, we get, we've been living in the, uh, the modernist world for depending on how you want to think about it, but I go back to, you know, 16th century stuff um, and the, uh, the, the connecting of the entire world together. Um, but alternative narratives, I think we're trying to construct those um, as we speak. Uh, well, to get back to the, uh, to the Buddhists uh, in, Tang China, you know, 1400 years ago, um, there was, there were, people were trying to, to live and buy some of these tenants. And there was a movement that began in the Tang um, and that continued into the Ming to release captive uh, animals, not just simply not to eat them, but to release them, to release birds, to release uh, cattle, to release all these things. Um, and a conception that uh, what they were doing to the environment, um, especially with trees and forests, uh, was uh, going to lead to destruction. But that did not stop Buddhist monasteries from in the Tang from being among the biggest economic development engines around. They would have you know four what we would call maybe 40,000 40, 40, acres, um, and they were 
using it for economic development. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't call that necessarily uh, an alternative um, narrative, but when it comes down to people thinking one thing and then trying to act that way or thinking and believing one thing and because of the nature of the world and the nature of subsistence having to act in another way, um, that's not necessarily uh, hypocritical. It's just the way it's been for a very long time. So I don't know if that gets anywhere near what you're interested in, Michael, but um, yeah, we, we the, the Modernist Project is uh, uh, bad for the environment. <laughs> Just put it that way. And a uh, thanks from from Mike. Um, we've we've reached our time. I think there's uh, there's there's so much more I'd love to to um, to go into about about regionalism and and I think we'll just have to bring you back for for a sequel discussion. But but this is um, it, it's 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 really been uh, enriching. And actually, Mike, by the way, I'm going over my questions. Mike asked a few of my questions anyway. I was interested in very similar topics um, because I, as a modern historian, I am allowed to at a, in a small department like this also cheat, uh, teach early Chinese history, which is always fun to go back and sort of go a little bit out of your wheelhouse and teach these different philosophical schools. But the the diversity of of the Chinese philosophical world um, that, uh, that 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 immediately kind of presents itself once you start scratching the surface of that is really. Is well, really yeah. Awesome. Let me just mention another another text from you know probably 200 BC or so, and this is largely a text that uh, is is located within the uh, uh, the legalist framework, the Fajia. But some of this is is uh, uh, very they're very interested in trying to understand natural processes to be able to prevent the state from screwing up the ability of nature to produce wealth that the state can tap over a long period of time, otherwise known as sustainability. And so that concept comes out of, of a warring states period in China. Um, you could call the modernist project coming out of the European warring states or the global warring states. Um, and consciousness of the uh, consequences of economic development uh, following our own nest. Um, so, you know, there's different traditions that can can move in a particular direction when it becomes a matter of, of the continuing existence and power of the state. Yeah, so. Can I ask a last, a last question here? Do you, yeah. it, in, and this is very current, this is, this is so present, it's future. Uh, do you see uh, Beijing as a potential leader on environmental policy um, going, going forward and, and what might that look like? Well, I think uh, uh, I think it's absolutely clear. You know, you travel in China, and you know that people uh, do not like to breathe polluted air. They don't like to suck on, you know, drink polluted water. And so there's a significant amount of uh, of resistance. Um, and I think it's just simply smart politics to uh, to start actually reforesting, replanting, cutting back on pollution, um, and you know, pollution is air pollution is not the same thing as global warming, but it's clear to me that uh, that that uh, Xi Jinping and the current Chinese state understands that global warming is a serious threat to them and China's future as it is to the rest of the world. It understands that, you know, carbon dioxide doesn't just stay in China. It circulates around the atmosphere and this, this the, it, carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a thousand years, you know? Methane stays only for 10 years. You know, we can stop eating rice, we can stop eating beef, but the, the methane, you know, that's gonna go away, but carbon dioxide's up there. And China's doing more about it than the US. More electrification of this, that, or the other thing than, than the US is even getting close to. So yeah, I think they can step out and have some uh, leadership, global leadership and credibility on that. Thanks very much, Bob. And uh, Dorothy Ko just said a quick hello as she as she signed off there in the chat. Um, I want to thank everybody for for joining. Some familiar faces and some new faces. Thanks, uh, Mike and Jim and uh, and Chelsea. Um, we will uh, be back on Thursday at noon with Perry Link, who I, I don't know if I accidentally bumped him 
off the chat when I was trying to unmute him or what happened there, but um, say hi to him for me. I will, and and uh, thank you so much, Bob. Please, everybody, join me in in giving Bob a, a virtual yeah. thank you, applause. Yeah. It was really a, a pleasure. Um, really get, getting getting in a little bit to this to this subject, and uh, it makes me want to learn a lot more. Um, and and stay tuned, Bob. Thanks, Good. and uh, uh, and a thank you from Jim Fennell in there. All right, we'll Thanks. log off for now, and I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bob. Do you want me to stay on for a second, Jim, Jeremy, or are we okay?